All right, we're going to get started with our last conversation of this Quest for Community conference. And I've noted before that there has been uh, quite a bit of blessing happening in how the panels have seemed to weave together and not a lot of intentionality in that. Well, this is the, this is the one panel that I was pretty, conversation that I was pretty intentional about. I really wanted Grace Olmsted to be here and to be here for this closing conversation because I think what she has put her finger on and is communicating so powerfully are the tensions within this communitarian view of politics and policy. We've seen it uh, explored in philosophy, in practice, uh, quantitatively. And as we close out this Quest for Community conference, I wanted to have a more personal conversation about how we live this out in a modern world. Uh, Grace's book, Uprooted, Recovering the Legacy of the Places We've Left Behind, and her other essays uh, related to this theme, I just think really help to capture the challenges to this as we've tried to highlight and, and Rich I think did a good job of it as well in the last panel. This is not intended to be a wistfulness for a bygone era. That's a natural human tendency to be nostalgic and to find security in the past. At the same time I think what we often don't do a good job of, especially those of us who th see things from a more conservative perspective, is we don't ask the modern culture to account for itself. Uh, I think our last panel was one way of doing that, was to look at the costs of a hyper-individualized culture, uh, whether that's in economics or in identity, uh, that there is a cost that we are gaining a better sense of to a culture that sees itself purely in individualistic terms. And so Grace Olmsted is an author, writer, editor. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, her background and, and this book. And, so why don't we actually just start there, Grace, by uh, talking just a little bit about this book, but really kind of what were some of the things going on in your life that led you to thinking, boy, I, I need to explore this through, through a book. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I grew up, I grew up in a small town in Idaho, rural Idaho, a town of about 3,000 people uh, named Fruitland for the orchards, which are no longer there. And um, when I was young, I was known more for my last name than my first. Um, I was Rick's daughter, or Wally's granddaughter, and the community I was surrounded by was extremely strong in uh, ties that had lasted for generations. I think this is largely because of the patterns of agriculture that had existed up until the mid 20th century. Um, and it was because of the strong social fabric that had grown up over time. But I, of course, grew up in a generation of young people who heard Belle from Beauty and the Beast say, there must be more than this provincial life. <laughs> and uh, young people who were really encouraged that in order to do something with their lives, they needed to go far. And in fact, if they were talented, they would go far. And so I ended up going to a Christian college on the East Coast, over 2,500 miles from my home. And um, I was there learning from some of the most brilliant people and reading brilliant texts. And I was so homesick. And I spent a lot of my time craving the smell of pine if I went hiking in the Shenandoahs because there's not a lot of that. 
um, on the East Coast. And then I would um, sit at a dinner on Sunday evening and miss my grandmother's peach pie. And I felt this deep ache for home. And in the midst of that, one of my professors assigned um, Remembering by Wendell Berry. And it's a short novella that Barry wrote about a young man who leaves home for college, who becomes a journalist, travels the world, and feels that same ache, and returns home to the community where he was raised. But it's not easy when he goes home. Things aren't smooth, things aren't easy. In fact, he loses his hand in a farm equipment accident. Um, and he's living in this world in which he feels to some extent dismembered also in a spiritual and emotional way. And he goes to this conference in California and he's wandering the streets wondering to himself, should I just leave it all behind? Should I just break free from all that I owe to the past and to place? And in that moment, um, Barry writes, he thinks of all those who came before who held him and who are even now holding him. And he realizes, even though I do not hold, I am held. Mm. And as I read that book, I realized there was so much I owed to the past and to place, to the community where I grew up and these strong bonds of affection and care that had uh, existed there. And I began to ask this question, what now should I do? Um, so of course, over time, that that was not always easy to determine, but I began writing about agriculture. Uh, my great, great, great grandparents moved to Idaho at the turn of the 20th century and began farming in that community and farmed up until my um, grandpa Wally retired from farming. But I, I began to kind of interest myself in this both because of my family's history in the world of agriculture and because of the fact that I was very interested in the way in which agriculture traditionally was undergirded by social capital. Um, and that study eventually led me home. I realized agriculture is one of the biggest things in the world to write about. Um, and it's very difficult to make it real, especially to people who increasingly are not attached to or know any farmers unless you pick a specific set of stories and tell them. So I picked the town where my great, great, great grandparents homesteaded, the town of Emmett, Idaho. And I spent the next several years researching the history of that place, talking to people farming there now, and interviewing uh, family relatives to get a sense for our own piece of the puzzle in connection to that community. So. And so in part, this connection grew out of this personal search and questioning. And then uh, obviously, as you were writing about agriculture, it led you back. I wanted to quote from uh, the introduction here, and I'm going to quote a couple passages back to you um, just to get your reflections on. on. So this is, this is from the introduction. Um, For several years now, I have felt as if my feet were planted in two different places, two very different sets of soil. I have experienced a deep sense of tension between the person I was and the person I've become and have long wondered when or whether I should choose between these two identities, these two places. And so one of the things that strikes me about that passage, especially as someone who, at least until recently, lived in a very metropolitan global city in Washington, D.C., is that for many people, uh, we probably both know it's not just deciding between two places. It may be deciding between four, five, six. But talk a little bit about this, uh, the tension that you felt and um, why you felt it was important to explore and how, how many of your contemporaries, friends and neighbors and others in your community we're having a, a maybe a similar sense of attention. Mm. So I'll start with the tension. I think um, a lot of us, all of us, were made to love a community and love it well. Um, 
in the beginning of Genesis, it says that the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the waters, and that word that's used, hovering, for this first work of creation is, in fact, a term that's used for a mother hen nesting on her chicks, or for any bird nesting, um, covering these eggs and producing life from them. And so I just recently wrote a chapter on subcreation for um, the Anselm Society talking about how, in fact, the creation mandate is one to nest. Um, and that oftentimes we've looked at the creation mandate, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth, and we've interpreted subduing as a very exploitative and extractive thing, um, whereas in fact we are to be nesters and to nest well and to make the world fruitful and beautiful and more healthy and more whole by our presence. Of course, creation groans because we have not done that. Um, but I think for a lot of people, there is, there is an ache of homesickness, even if you've never had a place that you could put your finger on that you say, oh, it was perfect, or That's, that was the place I lived the longest. We have this ache for a home that I think stems from that desire to nest and to live well in a specific place with love, with um, obligation and indebtedness and all of the things that come with those forms of fidelity. And so I think in my own life, I saw good patterns of that growing up. I was privileged mm -hmm. to have that. And so that was a large reason why and I desired forward, home. If you could talk a little bit about how you sense that growing up. Ah, yes. So I talk a lot in my book about my grandpa dad and grandma mom. They were actually my great grandparents, um, but their nicknames were grandpa dad and grandma mom. They grew up uh, in Emmett. My great grandfather was born on the Emmett bench and died on the Emmett bench at 96 years old. And um, the way in which they lived their lives was so deeply threaded into the life of their community that they, I would argue, lived in a way that is so rich, few of us really get to experience it to the degree that they did. They were involved in their local church. They taught um, Sunday school. My great-grandmother was involved in local boards. She was involved with the local nursing home. She hosted families. She worked with at-risk youths. Um, my great-grandfather helped out with the hospital. He was involved on the irrigation board districts work uh, and did a lot as well with the local community. And um, one thing that I noticed in talking to people who knew them and in my own observations is that they prioritized a method and way of life that was embedded and embodied. So my great grandfather around the 1980s and before had a chance like many other farmers to get big or get out. Uh, as Earl Butts famously recommended that farmers do. And he refused to. He kept to about 160 acres for his whole life because, A, he believed that was the amount of land that he could properly steward. Um, he kind of intuited what Wes Jackson has called the eyes to acres ratio. That is really an important point for people in regenerative agriculture. But also, he spent time that he would have otherwise spent very busy with an industrialized, very large farm production, um, educating war veterans post-World War II. He believed that the best thing he could do is actually to educate and help them get involved on their own farm productions post-war so that they would have a good um, foothold as they were looking at a new life at that point. And of course, if he had grown his farm at that point, he, not, he would not have been able to do so. Mm. And so in the decisions that they made as a couple and in their lives, I saw them consistently choose community over profit and um, difficult and often strenuous forms of obligation over ease or efficiency or profit. And so that was something that definitely appealed to me as well. And so I want to talk a bit um, about some of the some of these forces that you write about here on the agricultural side that were working against um, this sense of community obligation. But I want to talk a bit about in writing the book and going around, as happens with a book launch to a variety of audiences, um, this is very much of a different look at life. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to how this has been received by people in, that you know and friends in your neighborhood. And then as you've gone out around the country to talk about these themes in the book, 
Um, how is what are what are you hearing back now that you've told your story? I think there's a deep bipartisan desire for community, regardless of where people have grown up or what they've experienced. They see the need for strong, vibrant local community, and they're hungry for it in their own lives. Um, and so that's come up a lot. I think people who moved away from a community that they loved oftentimes do feel these same tensions between where they've been and where they are now and wonder how to be good stewards of um, all that they've received as they live in a new place. Um, so I've had some good conversations with people about that. I've talked to people who have moved back who are um, returners, as they're called, because they mm. believe they can make a huge impact in the communities where they grew up and they want to invest everything that they have learned as an adult, any sort of capital they might have in that community and to have an impact there. Uh, I actually talked to a group of Berkeley Law students who are working specifically in regenerative agriculture who told me how many of them want to go home and um, how deeply they want to invest in their local rural communities. I think their biggest struggle or fear was that they would be lonely, that they would, they would not find community in that place, that they would be so different politically or ideologically from the people that they grew up with that they might not belong. And so we talked a little bit about belonging. We also talked about how communities are not homogenous and there's always more diversity and beauty there than um, you might expect to see from the outside. And that also living with grace requires planting yourself in a place and loving the people there, even if you disagree with them quite strongly. And so, but what I saw in them and in so many other young people is, um, I think there's this deep desire to live a life full of meaning and to be giving back in tangible ways to the places we care about. I think that is actually quite strong. Uh, I really appreciate that the last panel talked so much also about the despair and nihilism though, because the problems are so big. I think that oftentimes young people feel they are drowning in them. And so part of the beauty, of course, of this is that it's about encouraging them to think prudentially, what can I do now and here? not getting so fixated on something that is beyond their scope of influence that they cannot feel that they can make small and incremental changes to bless others in, in their own lives. I wasn't thinking of going here, but I will, because it was a question I was also thinking about in regards to the last panel. How much, and I know actually um, this triggers another thought, there's a, a new documentary coming out, which we will be screening here uh, in the next month or so based on uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff's book, Coddling of the American Mind. And I know from seeing a trailer to that upcoming documentary, one of the themes that keeps coming back is the weight of issues that have been placed upon this Gen Z generation. Uh, whether it's on the environmental side or social justice side. And I wonder to what degree, as we see, will see, comes out of these uh, interviews with students, that a culture that has placed the consequences of actions at such a scale upon individuals is causing some of the issues around loneliness and despair um, that you're seeing that is triggering then this, this quest for community. One thing I've been thinking about and, and was um, considering during the last panel was just that I think having been raised with a Christian perspective and theology, um, there is an ability that we then have to see brokenness and to not be broken by it. Um, we can see and examine and understand that there is huge injustice in our world um, and also know that we are not called to immanentize the eschaton um, and that we are called to live gracefully and with compassion within that broken world. Um, and in fact, I'm going to pull out Simone Weil um, because this, these words both, I think, in a lot of ways, changed my life and how I think about living in place and gave me something I needed when I looked at both um, the strong desire for justice 
and anger over injustice on the left, and I think the danger of nostalgia or idolatry of the past on the right. So this is Simone Weil arguing that, in fact, true love of country should be characterized by compassion. Such a love, compassion, can keep its eyes open on injustices, cruelties, mistakes, falsehoods, crimes, and scandals contained in the country's past, its present, and its ambitions in general quite openly and fearlessly, without being thereby diminished, the love being only rendered thereby more painful. Where compassion is concerned, crime itself provides a reason not for withdrawing oneself, but for approaching, not with the object of sharing the guilt, but the shame. Mankind's crimes didn't diminish Christ's compassion. Thus, compassion keeps both eyes open on both the good and the bad and finds in each sufficient reasons for loving. It is the only love on this earth which is true and righteous. So when I started writing my book, I began uncovering all the horrible and unjust things that my state has done to people who have sought to live there. Uh, I discovered the discriminatory and racist practices that the town of Emmett had toward Japanese and Chinese immigrants, um, toward black families who tried to move there and farm, and countless other individuals who wanted to start a life there and be truly rooted. And so in the midst of praising and upholding the good, I also had to reckon with the unjust. And I see in Ve this answer, this drawing toward compassion that I think all of us truly deeply need. And that passage was from Ve's book? The Need for Roots. Yes. Yep. And I, I think this then is really what the quest for community in many ways is about. And you quote from Nisbet quite a bit in this, in this book. And I, wa I wanted to uh, just bring up another passage and, and get your reflections on it. A dangerous tension has always existed between American individualism and the neighborliness required for communal and agricultural flourishing. As professor and sociologist Robert Nisbet warned in his book, Quest for Community Liberalism's emphasis on the, dis quote, discrete individual, autonomous, self-sufficing, and stable, unquote, fostered an attitude that focused on emancipating man from his communal responsibilities and relationships in which he, quote, could develop limitably his inherent potentialities. Talk a bit about this this tension between um, this individual, uh, which is certainly a, at, at center of a large part of the understanding of the American project, the self-governing individual, but also the importance of this being formed within healthy and flourishing communities. Mm -hmm. So I talk a lot mm -hmm. in the book about kind of the maverick farmer, um, which I think is especially perhaps a, a type that's common in the West. Um, but my great-grandfather was extremely individualistic, strong-willed, and um, tended, I think, in his own life to want to do things by himself on his own and to be completely self-sufficient, um, which meant that at times he didn't do things that I kind of wish he would have done, like teach some of his incredible farming methodologies that he made up himself to his sons and grandchildren. He never did because they were his. Um, what I see, though, is the tension in his life that Tocqueville talks about, in which because he was embedded within this rich local community in which he had a large degree of um, obligations and in which he felt very much a part of local associations, all of his very individualistic tendencies were tempered by what Tocqueville calls a long succession of little services or constant habits of benevolence. He truly believed that he did owe things to his community and that he was to be a part of it, um, a member of it in a way that required much of him. And so I think when and where our individualism is not tempered by those things, what we see is, as Nisbet points out so beautifully, um, people who can, I think he quotes Tocqueville actually when he says that, uh, people who can touch their neighbor and not feel them, people who are so hermetically sealed from the world around them um, and who have no sense of their connection with their neighbors that they've in fact lost this sense of community and belonging that's integral to our life as humans. One of the interesting points that you make in the book is that there, there is a 
a rootedness that happens and can happen naturally just by being kind of born and raised in a particular community, but there's also a practice of becoming rooted, which even for those like yourself who grew up in one place and moved to Washington, D.C., is also a way of looking at how we interact with maybe our, not our, quote, native community. And I just wanted to pull out this one quotation here. There are many reasons, therefore, to leave a place, even a place we love, but why we leave and what we cultivate once we've moved to new ground are important questions to consider. So talk a little bit about what you see as kind of the practice of being a person who can become rooted even after they've moved from one place to another. So there's a Jim Elliott quote that I love um, in which he said, wherever you are, be all there, live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. And it's a quote I've brought up a lot in talking to people about this book because some people don't have a place to return to. Um, some people are not perhaps sure if they're living in a place for a long time or a short amount of time. Um, some people for a job, for a military career, are forced to move quite constantly. So I think Jim Elliott's words actually are both extremely practical and extremely helpful. Wherever you are, be all there. Um, we've talked about volunteerism, about church involvement, about all of the associations that both we can benefit and that benefit us. Um, neighborliness and I think different forms of involvement in your own small sphere, uh, whether it's knowing what's happening with your neighbor down the street or trying to have a sense for some of the dire needs that your community might have are just a few of those ways in which I think we, get, we begin to put down roots and to nourish the place that's nourishing us. Um, because of course I think the funny and ironic thing is um, Ve talks in her book about having multiple roots, social, educational, um, religious, cultural, um, but she never talks about place necessarily as a, a root that we have because we are all in a place. We are all already rooted there. How we live in that place then distinguishes whether we are living shallowly or deeply in that place. And I think there's always opportunities and a lot of um, diversity in how we do that in our, in our own lives and communities. You, you brought the word uh, up shallow, and it takes me again back to this last panel um, where the, the phrase shallow identities was, was brought up. I didn't think about it in these terms, but I wonder if we are to become rooted in our communities and find those identities in the different places w in which we participate, either faith communities or civic communities or just within our neighborhood, knowing our neighbors and so forth, whether you see that as a way of counteracting the, the fashion of these shallow identities. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much, I, I'm no expert on issues of uh, loneliness and other things that panel was talking about, but um, in the book, I talk a lot about Wallace Stegner's descriptions of boomers and stickers, which he was not speaking about, baby boomers. He suggested that um, in the United States, particularly the West, uh, different communities have been driven by, populated, and then depopulated by two groups. The boomers, who move into a place, um, in his words, pillage and plunder, extract the good, and then leave it behind and the stickers who move into a place and invest there and stay there and build a community over time. And so in his mind, the boomers, especially in the West, um, had such a horrific legacy if we think about, um, especially environmentally, some of the problems created through strip mining and other issues. And his goal and his desire was to help every individual, I think, consider in more depth what it means to be a sticker and to give back in tangible ways so your community, but there's always, I think, a temptation in our own era to live like boomers mm. um, and to have much more of an extractive mentality, whether it's toward our career, our families, the place that we're living in. And so um, in, I would add, in addition to that, I explore in the book a population I call the stuck, which are people who live in one place for their entire lives. Social mobility is down in a lot of communities, 
but they aren't truly actively living there. They don't feel like members. They don't have a way that they think they can give back. So how do we help the boomers and the stuck to become stickers and to truly feel both the obligations and the joys that come from living deeply in one place? One of the topics you also touch on here that Nisbet talked about, that Josh Mitchell talked about yesterday, is one of the other, I guess, engines of what might be called a radical individualism is what's difficult to describe in these terms, but is capitalism. And I think we saw in the, in the last panel yesterday that flourishing and mass flourishing can be seen really alongside and implicit in a rightly understood free market capitalist system. At the same time, as you point out here, and I think Josh pointed out as well, and, and Nisbet does too, that detach from a certain set of civic virtues uh, and obligations, you mentioned before, I think was your great grandfather, made personal decisions away from going to a a larger industrial farm, which probably would have had positive financial repercussions uh, for him, um, but decided not to do that because of these other obligations or responsibilities that he felt, both to the soil, so to speak, but also to a life that he valued for himself, not wanting to spend time on some of these other maybe more managerial administrative obligations, but to keep his hands and feet in the soil. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, as I, I think as with so many other conversations in our public square, um, and we are certainly seeing this in the polling of a young generation that increasingly identifies themselves as, as socialist, how we understand the trade-offs inherent within a positive capitalist system here that you've experienced and you saw and may be seeing others as well, making decisions within a system that may not have positive financial, uh, they're just other motivations. Um, so in kind of the study and research I've done into agriculture specifically, I think what we've seen in the last couple of centuries is just that consolidation, monopolization of different farm sectors and overproduction are all driven by crony capitalism in our <coughs> system and how we write policy, the farm bill, and how it allocates dollars and incentives. And um, all of them are also driven by the desire for profit without those tempering factors such as community obligation and ideas of collaboration and support, um, goods that exist outside of profit and efficiency that I think have to be brought to the table. And so, um, and of course, what we see is that overproduction, consolidation, monopolization have had an immense human and non-human toll. Um, so, for instance, the loneliness of the modern farmer and the um, mental health crisis of depression that they face, um, the exploitation of farm and food workers, of soil, of animals, um, the communal vibrancy that used to exist in a lot of rural America have completely broken down. There's a lot of schools that no longer have children who are going to those schools and um, communities that are emptied of all but the most aging individuals because A, there's no work for them to do, and B, um, the farms that exist that would have perhaps given them the opportunity to be involved in the community are now predominantly um, covered by one farmer covering thousands of acres with huge farm equipment. So there's just not community left in a lot of these places. Um, the toll of that uh, not just for the farmer and for the community, but then also for the soil. If you think about what happens when you just put corn and soybeans on the same thousands of acres every year for decades, that's a huge problem. Um, and it infects our water, it impacts our health in what we eat, and all sorts of other things. So I think um, considering how capitalism can benefit us and how it can lead us to uh, 
detrimentally impact health, our health, the health of the places we live in. Wendell Berry talked about the need for wholeness, and I think um, the agricultural industry, as it's been impacted by current systems of economic development, is definitely one in which we can see the divorcing of certain goods, such as profit, mm -hmm. from larger goods that promote that idea of wholeness. It seems that many have focused on Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations while not looking at his theory of moral More sentiments. sentiments. Right? Yeah. That there, it was always understood that within systems that offered great freedoms that we still had I think especially as those of us, myself, I'll speak for myself as a conservative, has a rather um, ironic view of human nature and, uh, and one that needs to be accounted for in systems that offer great freedom. Um, to quote another superhero, Spider-Man with great freedom comes great responsibility. <laughs> uh, uh, to paraphrase. Uh, so. Um, I have no idea where we are on time, and I want to make sure that we allow time for questions. What, what time is it? 45? OK, so let uh, open for questions. But I want to bring us up to where we are today. Uh, Grayson, speaking with you this morning, uh, we have updates on your own life, certainly re uh, relevant to the themes of this book. And so tell us a little bit about your th what's been going on with you and your family and, and, uh, and ways that in writing this book may have influenced some recent decisions for your own life. So the book came out as I had a three-month-old baby. Uh, so if you listen to any of the interviews from that time and I sound a bit fuzzy, I was. Um, and then kind of right out of that time period, I got accepted to Oxford University and got a master's in English and American Studies. I wanted to look at narratives of surrounding place and to think more deeply about how the stories we build um, that are particular to specific places and communities, um, how they can benefit or hurt them, and what it means to love a place through the pen, I guess, and to give of your time and talents as a writer to a place. And so that finished up in June, and uh, my family and I moved back to Boise, Idaho in August. So I'm about 30 minutes from where I grew up, 30 to 45 minutes, my brother's down the street, my grandpa's 15 minutes away, um, I'm working as a ninth grade teacher of history and literature part-time and have really loved the opportunity to invest a little more tangibly in my community through that. And I'm just keeping busy with a six-year-old, four-year-old, and one-year-old. That's, that's a lot. Plenty so. busy. Plenty <laughs> busy. Um, can you walk us through, if it's not too personal, just the decision to not go directly back? Boise is obviously a booming city. Um, but your, what was the decision process with your family to make the decision to leave D.C. and, and come back? And, and to what degree maybe yeah. your time in the U.K. had maybe influenced that set of decisions as well? Well, we had a very strong community in Virginia, so we didn't leave Virginia because there was anything lacking. Um, and in fact, when we came back and packed up our stuff to leave, there were so many tearful goodbyes. There were definitely moments where I wondered, what in the world are we doing? Um, we have so many friends and family members who we love there. But um, I felt a very strong calling to be close to my parents as they age. Um, that's something that, once again, thinking about obligation, what we owe to the people we love who have raised us. Um, that's something that matters a lot to me. And I hoped that there were ways I could be a returner and invest in the community that raised me. And my husband was gracious enough to say yes to that move and to plant himself in a completely new place that he's never lived in before. Um, and so the two of us together are figuring out our rhythms and liturgies as a family. What does life look like? Where do we go to church? Um, a lot of things that are just completely new. Even mm -hmm. if you've moved to a place you've lived in before, it's all starting over new to, s to an extent. Mm -hmm. So. We have questions. Yes, Michael. I know, yes. <laughs>
Uh, I definitely owe so much to, uh, I still say Dr. Mitchell, because I think it's respectful to do so. And I think um, his even kind of definition of the politics of gratitude was hugely moving for me as I began to think, what does it look like to have a life in the world that is characterized by gratitude um, and by ideas of indebtedness, of good forms of indebtedness that we live out with love and with um, immense thankfulness because of what we've received. And so, absolutely, I've only gotten to sit down with, um, I think Josh Mitchell wants to talk about Faith Whittlesey, which was a lot of fun. Um, but I think the, the growth and the um, importance of virtuous formation and inspiration in terms of the incredible thinkers of the past that can happen within education is one of the reasons why I'm attempting to teach ninth grade humanities. <laughs> um, because I want to talk to them about virtue and about magnanimity and indebtedness and modesty um, and so many of these ideas that I think can help them. We are talking about what it means to be a citizen, the rights and responsibilities of citizenship and how their life is to be motivated um, in order to both pursue freedom and justice. And what is freedom and what is justice to begin with? These are questions that um, I hope we can discover and study together and that will bless them in their future lives as a result. Why don't we go with Dr. Mitchell? Just a quick note about Mark Mitchell. Um, uh, he, he's a remarkable man, not only because of how smart he is, but because he's interested in building universities, the provost, the past and, uh, no, president, the provost, I'm not sure, provost, provost. Uh, but he's also a farmer. And, and I will say, my good fortune over the last 30 years has been this. Every graduate student who I've taught has come to me at one point or another. Every, everyone who's my own PhD, they, they've said, listen, I'm not, I'm not happy just being an intellectual. I need to build a world. Can you help me do it? And all of my guys, and they're all guys, have gone on to be both public intellectuals and leaders of universities or heads of journals. Uh, this is, the intellectual task is not just to read books. It is to convey we have the responsibility in reading great books to build the world that we mark is one of my prime examples. Great. Other questions? Yeah, Jennifer. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I'm actually a second year student at SVP and a lot of my focus has been on health policy. So in that, um, kind of pulling that string of what constitutes health, mental well-being health as well as physical health, I've come to kind of settle on probably my capstone around agricultural policy. So we've come at it for different reasons. But, um, so this is kind of off the topic of community, but I am, since you are in this community and I have friends that are producers of films, um, I'm kind of delving into that world of regenerative agriculture. To what extent, now that we've built this um, extractive commodification of crops, soy, wheat, corn, that we have to put into corn syrup, all these products that are addictive now, uh, two questions, to what extent does the does the demand side have to change, right, through education of food and what to eat um, and it being available? You know, typically right now, health is a luxury good, which I don't think it should be. Um, and also, can regenerative agriculture actually support, is that a feasible, um, is it a feasible solution to support the amount of food that needs, to, particularly when we're so disassociated disassociated, the, the big cities are disassociated from the farms, and you know, I happen to be blessed to be living in New York and LA, where the farms are just outside, and we have farmers markets, but that's not always the case, and mm -hmm. kind of these food deserts, so if you could shed some light on those two things. There's so many things. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first thing I would say is that absolutely, um, I think that we can and must have better, healthier ways of feeding the world. Um, and that, in fact, most of the world is not fed via large industrialized farm productions. But most other parts of the world, according to the Grain Foundation, are reliant upon local, local farmers and local agriculture. Um, how climate change might change that, how drought is going to impact some of those communities is still, I think, unknown. 
But once again, we're not going back. We are looking how to move forward in a prudential and virtuous way, which means we could hypothetically use technologies that exist now and use them in a way that promotes the good of wholeness um, in those and other communities. And I don't think that in farming we've always considered that or ever. And so that's something we could do um, far better than we do it now in cities, for instance, with things like aquaponics and others. We've seen lots of very interesting, innovative new ways to farm that are still looking towards the goal and the good of providing for their communities in a healthy way. Um, the other thing I would say is that scaling up and um, keeping health is always the difficulty and a lot of current agricultural um, commentators have talked a lot about collaborative farming and co-ops as the answer because what it would do is if multiple people own a piece of land or own land together but partner together in a cooperative in some form or fashion it enables them to specialize in things that they are very good at and that they want to grow in while also keeping diversity and health within the operation as a whole. So you rotate crops and ag um, cattle and livestock and chickens right. through that piece of property. You have someone responsible for communications, the business administration, so that you aren't having to do all of that by yourself. And in a sense, what they're saying is farming takes a village. Can we bring villages back? And that's kind of, I think, the goal is to think about how to bring a village mindset, a communal mindset, back to the realm of agriculture and to use that to farm healthfully and well, but at a scale that will help make sure that individuals are being fed. The final thing I would say is that food waste is a huge problem. We throw away so much food that could feed the world, I think, at least once over, according to the statistics. So we have a problem right there. We are overproducing everything. How is that food not getting to the food insecure is the real question, I think, that we haven't sorted out at this point. Thank you. Clark? Oh, that's so true. Yeah, I think in conversations I've had with not that particular group of students necessarily, but with other kind of thinkers on the left who care a lot about these topics, um, I would say that for the most part, many of them who are living in rural communities have that desire to live with humility and grace amongst their neighbors. Um, and that really there are some opportunities for partnership there. I have a wonderful friend who's mentored me and supported me in my own work um, who is about as far different ideologically as you could imagine, but we have bonded over um, our desire for the health of rural spaces and for our care for sustainable, healthy patterns of development and of agriculture in those spaces. And so I know that's not present everywhere, um, but again, one of the reasons I mentioned VEI is because I think one of the things that young people are perhaps especially hungry for is to understand how they can live with the immense weight of moral and righteous indignation they feel when they know themselves that they are not perfect. Um, we have to have grace and compassion and humility for ourselves as much as we do for others, and I think that missing piece is absolutely vital and something I should um, emphasize more when I talk with them. Other questions? Yes, Bill. Thanks for being here, Grace. 
I did it imperfectly. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I believe strongly is that my great grandparents would want me to live wherever I'm living in the way that they lived in their own community. Um, so, getting involved with the local church, um, bringing meals to people who needed meals, um, trying to have an impact with local nonprofits or charities, and to be involved there and to know what's going on with my community um, in a hands on way. Um, getting to know my neighbors and loving them insofar as I am able to do so. Um, even when they are not agreed with me on everything, um, some of my dearest friends in our neighborhood we lived in, in Virginia, um, we had a lot in common, but you probably wouldn't have expected it if you had just sat us down initially at a table and asked us who we vote for and, you know, kind of went through policy issues, but we were great friends. And I think um, living together and serving each other was, was a way in which that could happen. Uh, so I think living that sort of life within whatever place you live is a way to bless the community you came from because you're carrying that legacy forward to the new place in which you live. Um, and obviously this is a very detached way of doing it, but this book was a love letter to the past and to place as well. I wanted to see if there was a way I could give of my talents and time um, to try and bless that community. And I, I couldn't tell you how much it has done actual tangible work, but my hope was that the farmers I wrote about or the community that I wrote about, um, that funds and support and encouragement would come back to it as a result of writing about it. Please join me in thanking Grace Olmstead. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll close this here um, just to thank you all for participating in, um, I think, an important series of conversations. I said at the beginning that uh, the American Project, which has now become this new Mies Institute, uh, is a community unto itself, right? one that involves each of you. Uh, and will continue to, because I think for the reasons that we've heard here and, and throughout the panels, this way of understanding not just American policy, but American politics, I think is, is sorely needed. It's been great to hear not only about the work that's being done, but the things that are coming, right? Gene's book is forthcoming. It's going to address some of these issues. Seth, your book is forthcoming, excited about uh, seeing that as well, and um, and so the relationships, Dre, great to have you here, man, um, and others, is is about growing a movement that I think is important. So I, I just wanted to close with one thing. I hel I've held this story to the end, and I'm, this may not be as impactful to you as it is to me. So. After I first read the book, Quest for Community, um, totally rocked my world about 15 years ago. And I thought just in a, as an aside, I'd read a later edition of it. And I said, I'm going to buy an original edition of Quest. And through the website, Alibris, which is a used book website, I managed to find an original 1953 copy of Quest for Community. And after I got it, I flipped through the pages and reread it again. 
And on the inside front cover is an inscription that says, to George P. Adams, with, in affection and respect, Bob. So you come to find out, if you go in a couple pages here, into the preface of a 1953 book, uh, Nisbet writes, there are certain individuals to whom I owe thanks of a special kind. The first is the late Fred Tegart, for many years professor of social institutions at the University of California, Berkeley. The second is George P. Adams, Mills Professor of Mental and Moral Philosophy and Civil Polity. How about that as a professorship? at the same university. It is unnecessary to attempt to indicate the precise nature of my debt to each, but let me say that apart from interests and insights gained originally from both of these men, it is difficult for me to imagine any of this book's coming into existence. So, Bob, of course, is Bob Nisbet. And just by happenstance, in ordering this book, an original copy, I happened to get the Bob Nisbet signed book to George P. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> and what's as remarkable as that is, is the fact that the book that was signed to George P. Adams found its way onto the Alibris website. How did that happen? Who would let that happen? <laughs> now, Maybe George did, or maybe George didn't, right? If, if, if Professor Adams passes away and family's going through the, I'm sure, what was a vast library, I mean, if you're, if you're the professor of, uh, let's see, social, ins uh, uh, of mental and moral philosophy and civil polity, I'm sure you've got an excellent library. <laughs> And so this could have been one of thousands of books in Professor Adamson's, Adams' library that other family members or maybe just employees or staff or others at the University of California, Berkeley just said, yeah, just sell it on a Libris. And what strikes me, Michael, by your, the genealogy, that intellectual genealogy you just had to Mark and to Josh and to you is and it is such an important part, I think, of community, is this book is in our hands now, right? These themes, these discussions, this lens through which we understand the American project, that is in our hands. And as there's one theme, I think, that we've kept coming back to is this importance of taking personally our own role in the flourishing of our communities. Now, this book is going to my daughter, who is over there someday when I'm dead. But I'm not letting it go until then, right? And I think maybe in a, in a similar way that, and my hope is, that institutionalizing this work in this new Mies Institute is a way of, again, building a hedge around this view of the world, but also expanding that out to build this community and to not drop this in a Libris, <laughs> right? Now, I'm happy somebody did that, or else I wouldn't have this book today. Um, but at the same time, it just reminds me again, as, as the panels have, about how special th this group is. Uh, but more importantly, the gratitude I feel uh, for this American project. And, and what I really do feel personally, I'll speak for myself, called to build and to do. And I thank you all for your shared commitments to that as well. And uh, I look forward to our next steps together. So thank you.